Hello class. I hope you're all enjoying your February vacation. This is your audio lecture for chapter six, learning. This particular chapter is gonna talk about the three types of responses to stimuli. We're gonna learn about the types of learning. It's gonna help us to understand where our behavior comes from. How do we know what to do in responses to our environment? The core of this definition is the change in behavior. So we're gonna learn about what learning is, what is the meaning of it? And the deepest part of that definition is change in behavior. After learning, we can do something new that we couldn't do before. And at the most basic level, behavior refers to any observable response. So learning, if we look at the images on the screen here, the loggerhead sea turtle hatchlings are born knowing how to find the ocean and how to swim. Unlike the sea turtles, humans, however, must learn how to swim. As humans, we pride ourselves on our ability to learn. And in order to understand learning, we want to really dig deeper into what processes are at work as we come to know what we know. Psychologists define learning as a relatively permanent change in behavior or the capacity for behavior due to experience. And the core of this definition is change in behavior. After learning, we can do something new that we couldn't do before, providing us with enormous advantages in surviving a changing world. Not all changes in behavior are due to learning, however. Our behavior changes as we mutate, mature, from infancy through adulthood. Behavior can be changed by brain damage or by having a psychological disorder. So our definition of learning limits the changes we consider to be learned to those that we result from experience. The other qualifications in our definition, relatively permanent, if we look at that definition, prevents the labeling of brief or unstable changes, such as when we experience different moods or suffer from an illness as learning. So when you're in a different mood, that isn't definite, necessarily relatively permanent. So it's not categorized as learning. Now, before we can understand learning, we must first study unlearned behaviors, the things that we instinctively know and have as a reflex. So instincts and reflexes are innate behaviors that organisms, you're born with them. It helps you in order to survive and adapt to your environment. Reflexes are motor and neural reactions to a specific stimuli. So think physical bodily movement. It's simpler than instincts because it involves activity of specific body parts. It involves the central nervous system, the spinal cord and the medulla. So an example is human babies are born with a sucking reflex. Now instincts, however, are behaviors that are triggered by a broader range of events, aging, change of seasons. Instincts are more complex. They involve movement of the organism as a whole. So think sexual activity and migration, these are instincts. And they involve higher brain centers. We instinctively want to engage in sexual activity or potential migration, meaning moving towards our species. So you think when you hear the word migration of birds, birds migrate down south during colder times, like days like today when it's snowing outside. However, humans also migrate as well. You migrate to where your community might be. You might move to the same neighborhood as all your friends out of college. Now, if we break down reflexes even further, I'll give you this example. Imagine you're sitting in class when all of a sudden you hear a loud banging right outside the door. What would your very first reaction to the unexpected noise be? If you're like most people, you would immediately stop listening to the lecture and turn your head in the direction of the noise. This is a very normal response at, known as an orienting reflex. Orienting reflexes occur when we stop what we are doing to orient our sense of organs, 
our sense organs, in the direction of the unexpected stimuli. In short, we exhibit the orienting reflex to any type of novel stimulus. Reflexes are fast. They're involuntary responses to stimuli that are mediated by circuits in the spinal cord and brainstem that serve to promote our welfare. They are inflexible, meaning we cannot stop them. And they are not learned through experience. Your physician checks on one of these reflexes by tapping your knee with the rubber hammer. The tap stretches your leg muscles and the stretch is sensed by the neurons in the spinal cord. The motor neurons in the spinal cord tell your thigh muscles to contract to compensate for stretching and your foot kicks out. No experience with knee tapping is necessary to produce this behavior, nor can you voluntarily prevent it. By the time your brain realizes your knee is tapped, you've already reacted and your knee has are in your leg is already extended. Other reflexes pull our bodies away from, stim from painful stimuli. When we step on a tack or a piece of glass or touch a hot stove, turn our heads in the direction of loud sounds and help us stand upright and walk. Reflexes, however, have the disadvantage of being inflexible and not adaptable to change. For example, we respond to stress or cold by forming goosebumps or bumps on the skin. This reflex appears to be a leftover from a time in which our species had more body hair. Goosebumps raise each strand of hair, which in times of stress makes an individual look larger, scaring off a predator or a competitor. And in response to cold, traps more insulation air, insulating air near the skin. As you can all tell, most of us have lost all of this extreme body hair. But the advantages of this reflex decreased meaning we no longer had the body hair to keep us warm or make us look larger, but we still retain the behavior of goosebumps. Our skin still has that effect when in cold or stressful situation. Now, instincts are innate patterns of behavior elicited by environmental stimuli that do not require learning. So like reflexes, Instincts do not need to be learned and are inflexible. However, the huge difference is that instincts are much more complex than reflexes and are mediated by processes higher in the brain. So an example of a human instinct is contagious yawning or yawning in response to seeing others yawn. This is an instinct. Although yawning has multiple functions, including cooling the brain, contagious yawning might be related to empathy helping to synchronize the arousal state of whole groups. I can see that you're tired and I'm gonna empathize with you and yawn as well. This is important for question one. Question one is for your homework is gonna ask you to identify three human instincts and why they are important to survival. What is it that we do instinctively that helps us to live further and have longer lives and survive. 20th century psychology was dominated by the beliefs that compared to other animals, human beings have relatively few reflexes and instincts and that most human behavior results from learning. William James, however, argued against this and that human beings have more instincts than other animals, although we are usually unaware of them. According to James, our behavior simply appears more complex and thoughtful because we often face the need to choose between competing instincts. Animals with fewer instincts experience fewer conflicts, so their behavior appears to be more automatic and less thoughtful. William James's approach to instinct and learning is echoed in the writings of contemporary evolutionary psychologists who argue for an innate learning instinct that prepares human beings to learn certain things in particular ways based on evolutionary history. Cognitive psychologists also revived the flavor of James by suggesting that learned behavior resulting from experience can look very automatic and instinctive. For example, prejudice towards a group of people requires learning, but prejudice behavior often occurs without much conscious awareness. You're not even aware that you're doing it, making it seem almost automatic and instinctual. People who consciously behave that they are without prejudice or believe that they are without prejudice towards members of a minority group 
will nonetheless sit farther away from an individual from that group than members of the majority. It's something that they unconsciously know how to do. Now, now that we understand unlearned behavior in reflexes and instincts, this is where we can dig deeper into learning. Learning also helps organisms adapt to their environment, but learned behaviors involve change and experience. So if learning is defined as a relatively permanent change in behavior or knowledge that results from experience, it involves acquiring skills and knowledge through that experience. It involves conscious and unconscious processes. When we look at learning and we study learning, we're gonna be studying what's called associative learning. When an organism makes connections between stimuli or events that occur together in an environment. And there are three different approaches to learning that we're gonna study. We'll look at approaches that are part of behaviorism. So all of this chapter is leading towards what's known as behavioralism. We have courses at this institution like applied behavior analysis or learning psychology that talk about things like classical conditioning and operant conditioning and observational learning. So first we'll start with classical conditioning. Ivan Pavlov's research on the digestive system of dogs unexpectedly led to his discovery of the learning process now known as classical conditioning. And many of you might have heard people talk about Pavlov's dog. So in classical conditioning, this is a process by which we learn to associate stimuli and consequently to anticipate particular events. Pavlov noticed that dogs salivated not only at the taste of food, but also at the footsteps of the lab assistants as they approached the dogs. He realized that organisms have two types of responses to its environment an unconditioned, meaning unlearned response, and a conditioned or learned response. So in the most famous example, dogs were conditioned to associate the sound of a bell with food. When the dogs heard the bell, they anticipated food and began to salivate. So before conditioning occurred, the unconditioned stimulus or the unlearned stimuli that elicits the, re the, the stimulus that elicits a reflexive response is the food. So when you see food, you have this unconditioned reflexive response of salivating. And that's the UCR, the unconditioned response, salivation, a natural unlearned reaction to a stimulus. So you can see that relationship there. Food is the UCS and salivation is the UCR. Now, during conditioning, you introduce what's known as a neutral stimulus. This is something that is totally neutral and not related to the above UCS and UCR. This is a stimulus that does not naturally elicit this response. In this case, the ringing of a bell. When you ring a bell, it does not cause salivation by itself prior to conditioning. Now, what happens is they pair, they pair the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus together. So when food is introduced, so is the ringing of a bell at the same time. Now because food is, is given to the dogs, they also end up salivating. But at the same time, they're hearing the bell at the same time. After enough time of presenting both at the same time and pairing them together, after conditioning, you remove the unconditioned stimulus, the food, and you now have a conditioned stimulus. So your neutral stimulus has now moved into becoming a conditioned stimulus that now elicits a response after repeatedly being paired with an unconditioned stimulus. So now the bell has become a conditioned stimulus, creating salivation, and salivation is now known as a conditioned response a behavior caused by the conditioned stimulus. So you can see it in, illustrated in this picture here. Good. Now, 
as Pavlov deeper studied deeper this sort of classical conditioning, he also looked at what was known as higher order conditioning. This is an established condition stimulus is paired with a new neutral stimulus. This is known as the second order stimulus. So that eventually the new stimulus also elicits the conditioned response without the initial condition stimulus being presented. So you can see here the example of higher order and second order. The cat is conditioned to salivate when hearing the electric can opener. Now the squeaky cabinet door becomes a second order stimulus is paired with the can opener. So when they open the cabinet door, the squeaky cabinet door to get the can opener, then the squeaky cabinet door becomes the thing that makes the cat salivate or the condition stimulus. So the cat learns to associate the cabinet door with the electric can opener and therefore with the food. Now, there are general processes to consider when understanding classical conditioning. First is acquisition. This is the initial period of learning when an organism learns to connect a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus. This usually requires there to be a very short time interval between the NS and the UCS and for the pairing to be repeated multiple times, meaning the ringing of the bell and the presenting of the food probably happened pretty simultaneously or the bell and then immediately giving the, the dog the food really close together. And it had to be done probably a significant number of repeated times in order for acquisition to occur. Now, sometimes conditioning can occur when the interval is up to several hours and the pairing occurs only once. Think taste aversion. We all talked last week about tasting something terrible and still having memories of it and still totally avoiding those foods. That's technically classical conditioning. You may have gotten sick after eating something bad. That considers that can be considered as classical conditioning. You had a neutral stimulus, which is vomiting, now paired with a particular food you may have eaten, and now you're totally averse to it. You behave differently based upon the pairing of those two things. Now, extinction is the decrease in the conditioned response when the UCS or the unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented with the conditioned stimulus. So if food stops being presented with the sound of the bell, then eventually the dog will stop responding to the bell. So yeah, the dog was starting to salivate strictly at the sound of the bell, but if over time they just were ringing this bell and never ever presenting the dog with food, it's going to lose that relationship. It's no longer going to salivate. Now, there is also such a thing as spontaneous recovery. This is the return of a previously extinguished conditioned response following a rest period. That can happen. So say they stop ringing the bell before giving the dog the food and they wait a month, but then they bring it back and they ring the bell. It's still potentially going to be spontaneously recovered. When we study classical conditioning, we also want to look at sort of this, over time, the strength of the conditioned response. So when the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus are both being paired together and you're achieving acqu um, acquisition, and then when the CS is alone for a long period of time, you can see extinction occurs and the behavior begins to decrease, right? The conditioned response begins to go down. Then you pause that for a long period of time and you take a break. And then you see spontaneous recovery of the conditioned response, not quite as high as that it was at, at its peak performance, but then it begins to extinct at a quicker rate if the conditioned stimulus is continuously presented alone. So that rising curve shows the conditioned response quickly getting stronger through the repeated pairing of the CS and the UCS, the U UCS together. Then the curve decreases, which shows the conditioned response weakens 
when only the condition stimulus is presented. So this is showing you extinction. After a break or pause from conditioning, the condition response reappears, but then as the CS alone is strictly being, so if the bell is only being rung by itself and no food is being presented, you're once again going to see extinction occur at a higher rate. Now, it's important when understanding learning, both classical conditioning as well, that organisms need to be able to distinguish between different stimuli in order to respond appropriately. So in this case, stimulus discrimination is when an organism learns to respond differently to various stimuli that are similar. So the dog can discriminate between the specific bell sound that signals food and a similar bell sound that does not signal food. So we have the ability to distinguish, right? It's your ability to understand the difference between your alarm on your phone that wakes you up to get to school and your fire alarm that might go off should there be a smoke in your house. You also have the ability to, to generalize stimuli. So this is when an organism demonstrates the conditioned response to stimuli that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. So if an individual learns to dislike a specific spider, they will usually then dislike all spiders. Or if you dislike a particular type of music, you generally dislike all music that falls into that category because there's this one band that you don't like. So you also can generalize a stimuli. So classical conditioning can also lead to what's known as habituation. This is when learning not to respond to a stimulus that is presented repeatedly without change. So as a stimulus is repeated, we learn not to focus our attention on it. So if you are with someone and sitting next to you and they're tapping their leg and it's kind of annoying you because the movement is a stimuli that is different and a change. But as it occurs over time, over a long period of time, you may tend to learn not to focus on it. You habitually learn not to focus on it. Now, after Pavlov, it became very clear that psychologists were beginning to lean more towards behaviorism. And this is when John B. Watson used the principles of classical conditioning that Pavlov used in the study of human emotion. Okay, so now we're starting to take this sort of reflexive learned behavior and tie it to how we emote and believe that all behavior could be studied as a stimulus response reaction. Watson believed in the principles of classical conditioning could be used to condition our hormone emotions, meaning change how we emote, how we may feel sad or happy or angry. He did this by conducting a famous study with little Albert. Watson exposed little Albert to a certain stimuli and conditioned little Albert to fear them. Fear seems to be the big emotional thing that a lot of psychologists studied. So the little Albert would be presented with a neutral stimulus, a rabbit, a dog, cotton wool, a white rat, etc. Watson then paired these with a loud sound every time little Albert touched the stimulus that caused him to feel fear. After repeated pairings, little Albert became fearful of the stimulus alone, such as the white rabbit. Although initially conditioned to fear specific stimuli, they were all furry and therefore through stimulus generalization, little Albert came to fear furry things, including Watson in a Santa Claus mask, which you can see pictured here. There is no evidence whether little Albert's fear was long lasting or not back then they didn't follow up on their subjects when they studied them. But Watson actually was able to prove that through using classical conditioning, we were able to elicit a specific emotional response rather than a reflexive physical response like salivating. This then led, this then led, led to operant conditioning. And this was a theory posed by B.F. Skinner. Now in operant conditioning, 
organisms learn to associate a behavior and its consequences. So Skinner was responsible for introducing reinforcement and punishment. And he used the law of effect in order to influence how well his theory was interpreted. He believed that if you experience pleasant consequences and a desired result, then obviously behavior is more likely to occur. You're going to do it again. If you experience an unpleasant consequence or an undesired result, then obviously you're gonna be less likely to behave that way again. When we show up at work, this is our behavior, we get paid a pleasant consequence. So we continue to show up to work. Skinner then conducted experiments, mainly with rats and pigeons, to determine how learning occurs through operant conditioning. What's important for us to remember when we study operant conditioning before we move forward is this particular area uses words that tend to already have specific connotations in our brains, like the use of the word consequence. Feels weird and like an oxymoron to say pleasant consequence. Consequence automatically feels like a bad word. However, if you look up the definition of consequence, it merely just means results. It merely just means what happens afterwards, okay? So it's important when we use the word consequence, we are not giving it a negative connotation at all times. Same is true when we use the words positive and negative and reinforcement and punishment. So the terminology for operant conditioning is that when we use the word positive, we're meaning to add something. So think of it mathematically. When we say the word positive, that means that something has been added. When we use the word negative, it means that we've taken something away. We've subtracted something. When we use the word reinforcement, it means that we're looking for an increase in behavior. So something occurs over and over again. It continues. When we use the word punishment, we're talking about a decrease in behavior. So, if we look at classical versus operant conditioning, in classical conditioning, this approach is pairing an unconditioned stimulus like food with a neutral stimulus such as a bell, and the neutral stimulus eventually becomes the conditioned stimulus, which brings about the conditioned response of salivation. And the stimulus timing occurs immediately before the response, right? So it happens really quickly. On the other hand, in operant conditioning, the target behavior is followed by either reinforcement or punishment. So you take the target behavior and then you follow it up with reinforcement or punishment. It's not happening at the same time or just before like it is in classical conditioning. And whether you're using reinforcement or punishment, it's either to strengthen or weaken the behavior. So if you're using reinforcement, you're looking to strengthen that behavior so it continues to occur. Or if you're using punishment, you're looking to weaken that behavior so that it, learning is more likely to exhibit the desired behavior in the future, okay? And in this case, the stimulus is the reinforcement or punishment occurs soon after the response. So Skinner did this or showed operant conditioning using what was known as the Skinner box. He placed animals inside an operant conditioning chamber, renamed Skinner box, containing a lever that when pressed causes food to be dispensed as a reward. So the goal is to have the rat press the lever. That's the behavior they want to increase. So if they want to increase that behavior, they need to add something to it, okay? So they need to give them a positive reinforcement or reward such as food. Now, when we break down just reinforcement, there are two types. There's positive reinforcement. So something is added to increase the likelihood of a behavior. So common examples are high grades. A high grade is positive reinforcement for good study habits. Um, you're more likely to increase um, good study habits by getting a high grade. Paychecks, okay? We're positively reinforcing 
going to work, performing your duties by giving you a paycheck or by praise. Oftentimes our behavior is increased, our good behavior is increased by praise that we receive from others. We receive, we require this good validation. Negative reinforcement, however, is something is removed to increase the likelihood of behavior. One of the most common everyday examples is the beeping sound that will only go away when you put your seatbelt on. We remove something in order to increase your behavior. So if you don't do it, it continues to occur in a bad way. Sticker charts that parents might use to reinforce doing chores or behaving good at home or at school is a form of positive reinforcement as another example. Now punishment is totally different. Positive punishment, which feels again like an oxymoron, is something is added to decrease the likelihood of behavior. So scolding a student for texting in class. Scolding them, you're adding the scolding. The scolding is being added in order to decrease the behavior, okay? Now, negative punishment is something is being removed to decrease the likelihood of behavior. Taking away a favorite toy when a child misbehaves, not giving them their allowance for that week if they do something bad, okay? Now, in operant conditioning, we also use a tool called shaping. Shaping is a tool used in operant conditioning, and instead of rewarding only the target behavior, we reward successive approximations of a target behavior, meaning behaviors are broken down into many small achievable steps. So it's useful when teaching a complex chain of events and is commonly used by animal trainers. So in shaping, you might first reinforce any response to that that resembles the desired behavior. Then reinforce the response that more closely resembles the de desired behavior, no longer reinforcing previously reinforced responses. Then begin to reinforce the response that even more closely resembles the desired behavior and continue to do this until only the desired behavior is what is reinforced. Now, when using reinforcement, there are primary and secondary reinforcers. Rewards to reinforce behavior can come in many forms, praise, stickers, money, toys, gifts. Primary reinforcers are those that have innate reinforcing qualities, food, water, sleep, sex, and pleasure. The value of these reinforcers does not need to be learned. You already know the value of them. Secondary reinforcers are those that have no inherent value. Their value is learned and becomes reinforcing when linked with a primary reinforcer. So praise, a secondary reinforcer, is linked with affection, a primary reinforcer. Money is only reinforcing when it can be used to buy other things, such as things that satisfy basic needs, food, and other secondary reinforcers. Tokens are a secondary reinforcer that can be exchanged for other things. You commonly see token economies used in many settings to encourage correct behaviors. You see this in prisons, in schools, and mental institutions. Now, it is important to talk about reinforcement schedules. The best way to teach a behavior is with positive reinforcement. So yes, punishment can be useful when necessary. However, positive reinforcement seems to be the best way to teach behavior. And there are many ways that positive reinforcement can be administered. In continuous reinforcement, when an organism receives a reinforcer each time it displays a behavior. And this is the quickest way. So if a dog receives a treat every time it sits when told to, it's going to learn to sit quickly. And timing is important. The treat must be presented immediately after sitting in order for the dog to associate the target behavior with the consequence. 
However, if the trainer suddenly stops providing treats, the dog will stop sitting. So another type of reinforcement is then used once the behavior is learned. Now, partial reinforcement is the organism does not get reinforced every time they display the desired behaviors, meaning that they're reinforced intermittently. And there are several types of these partial reinforcement schedules. First is the fixed and variable schedules. The fixed one is the number of responses between reinforcements or the amount of time between reinforcements is set and unchanging. So giving a dog a treat every fifth time he sits, okay? Or giving a child a treat, um, a piece of candy for every 30 minutes that they pay, play quietly. Now a variable schedule is the number of responses between reinforcements or the amount of time between reinforcements varies or changes. So it might be every, it might be, oh, for every, the dog sits five times, gets a treat, then they sit three times and get a treat, then they sit 12 times and get a treat, and it just varies. Now, the interval versus ratio schedule is different. In the interval, the schedule is based on the time between reinforcements, and the ratio is the schedule is based on the number of responses. So if you pair these two things together and you have, for example, a fixed interval schedule for partially for reinforcement, this means reinforcement is delivered at predictable time intervals. Patients take pain relief medications at set times. A variable interval means that reinforcement is delivered at unpredictable time intervals, meaning you might check Facebook at random variable times and you might have new notifications in there at random variable times. Fixed ratio is reinforcement is delivered after a predictable number of responses. So factory workers being paid for every X number of items manufactured. A variable ratio is when reinforcement is delivered after an unpredictable number of responses. Think gambling at a slot machine. You might pull that lever or push that button at random intervals and be rewarded with money randomly and not know. And if we look at the difference between these four schedules and which one is most, you know, yields the different response patterns, the variable ratio schedule here is unpredictable and yields high and steady response rates with little, if any, pause after reinforcement. So the gambler. So this is the gambler. Okay. The fixed ratio schedule is predictable and produces a high response rate as well with a short pause after reinforcement. So think like any salesperson who gets a reward after a specific fixed schedule. And then the variable interval schedule is unpredictable and produces a moderate steady response rate. So think restaurant manager. And then a fixed interval schedule yields a scallop shaped response pattern and reflects a significant pause after reinforcement. So think surgery patient. Now, due to all of this sort of reinforcement in the work that Skinner did around reinforcement, many psychologists began to study gambling in the brain. Some research suggests that pathological gamblers use gambling to compensate for abnormally low levels of the hormone norepinephrine, which is associated with stress and is secreted in moments of arousal and thrill. They're looking to get that. So they're teaching themselves or their brain is learning how to get more epinephrine by using gambling. The unfortunate part though is gambling is on a variable ratio schedule, meaning they don't know every time that they're gonna get it each time they play. Now, when understanding learning, we also wanna understand cognition and what's known as latent learning. So research conducted by Edward C. Tolman found that learning could still occur without reinforcement. This introduced the idea that there is a cognitive aspect to learning. While studying rats, he found, while studying rats, he found that if he put them in a maze to learn their way through it, they could eventually form a cognitive map of it. Meaning that he was able to tell most everyone that everyone has the ability to create a mental picture of the layout of an environment. 
And after 10 sessions in the maze, without food as reinforcement, food was placed at the exit, and the rats were able to very quickly exit the maze, showing that they had learned the way out. This is what we call latent learning. Learning that occurs but is not observable in behavior until there is a reason to demonstrate it. So children may learn behaviors from their parents that they do not demonstrate until they are older. A child may learn the route to school from watching their parent drive there, but will not demonstrate this until they can drive themselves or have to get there by bike, walking, etc. And you can see a picture of this here as a cognitive map. Now, this observational learning, the third form of learning is observational learning, also known as modeling. Observational learning is learning by which others, and then intimidating, learning by watching others and then um, imitating. The model is the individual performing the imitated behavior. So in this photo, the spider monkey learned to drink water from a plastic bottle by seeing the behavior modeled by a human. Question three of your homework. Children may imitate violence they've seen on TV or video games. How can parents, teachers, or caregivers overcome the influence of violence in the media? You can see observational learning occurring here. Yoga students learn to observe as the yoga instructor demonstrates the correct stance and movement for her students. So that is a live model. Models don't have to be present for learning to occur. Through symbolic modeling, this child can learn a behavior by watching someone demonstrate it on television. As you see here. This then led observational learning then led to what was known as social learning theory and Albert Bandura. In order to explain how learning occurred without external reinforcement, positive or negative, Albert Bandura proposed social learning theory. He believed that observational learning involved more than just imitation and that internal mental states must be involved. So there were four steps in this modeling process that he theorized. First was attention. Focus on the behavior. Then there was retention. Remember what you observed. Then there's reproduction, being able to perform that behavior. Observational learning can't happen if you don't have the physical ability to perform the behavior that you've seen. You then have motivation. They must want to copy the behavior. So motivation depends on what happened to the model. If they saw the model getting you know, praise and all this accolades and things like that, then they're going to want to or be more motivated to copy the behavior. So we then have vicarious reinforcement, the process by which the observer sees the model rewarded, making the observer more likely to imitate the model's behavior. We also then have vicarious punishment, the process where the observer sees model punished, making the observer feel less likely to imitate the model's behavior. And it led to Bandura's Bobo doll experiment. So in this famous study known as the Bobo doll experiment, and if any of you don't know what a Bobo doll is, it's this sort of inflated clown looking thing. You can kind of see it down here in this photo best. At the bottom of it, it's weighed down by sand or water. And what you were able to do is punch it and it would just sort of come right back up because of it was weighed down the bottom. And what Bandora wanted to study was the modeling of aggressive and violent behaviors because this toy was basically created so that it could be punched. But what he did was sort of like elevate it. He had children observe adults act aggressively towards this five foot Bobo doll. The adult was then either punished, praised, or ignored for their behavior. The children were then given the opportunity to play with the Bobo doll themselves. If the child had seen the adult punished, they were less likely to act aggressively towards the doll. 
if the child had seen the adult praised or ignored, they were more likely to imitate the adult. So ben, from this, Bendora concluded that children watch and learn from the adults around them, which can have both pro-social and antisocial consequences. And then the last question. This is what then has led a lot of psychological researchers to study this topic and suggest that there is a correlation between watching violence and aggression in children. Can a video game make us violent? So for your four questions, the first one, like I said, is human instincts. Identify three of them. Explain why these behaviors are instincts and discuss their importance to survival. Why do we need them in order to continue to live or survive? Two is no more learning. Suppose starting now you'll be unable to learn anything new. What does this mean to you and how would this impact your life? If you could not learn anything new, if you could not even observe others' behavior and model it, if reinforcement and punishment didn't work or your ability to tie a new stimulus with an old stimulus, what would that do to your life, okay? How would that impact where you see yourself going in the future? Then question three is children see and may imitate violent actions seen on TV or in the movies. How can parents, teachers, and care providers help overcome the influence of violence in the media? So what are some things that parents can do to either help overcome this or teach them why it's important to recognize good and bad behavior. Think about the Bobo doll experiment. Then question four is consider how women are portrayed in televisions and movies and video games and other media. What does this tell developing girls and young women about who and what they should be? Are any of the messages realistic? What are females, young females learning from the media based upon how females are portrayed? What is the learned behavior that's occurring there? I hope you all had a really great vacation week. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out via email, nwest at westfield.ma.edu.